Thank you to everyone for coming. Really appreciate it. So, four years ago, I flew to Philadelphia with my friend Audrey for a visit to the Mutter Museum. The Mutter began as a private collection of medical specimens put together by Dr. Thomas Dent Mutter. In 1858, Dr. Dent donated this wonder cabinet to the Philadelphia College of Surgeons, where it became their teaching collection. Now the Mutter is open to the public, and it's famous for such holdings as a plaster cast of the original Siamese twins, Chang and Ang Bunker, the skeleton of the Kentucky giant, uh, and I stress the Kentucky giant, even though the websites say the Irish giant, it's not correct. Uh, and an entire wall of human skulls. Some specimens represent more normative human bodies, but the focus of the collection is on disability, mainly those, re uh, those resulting from injury, disease, and birth anomalies. Now, Audrey and I both had professional reasons for our visit. We pretended not to be affected by the Mutter's reputation as, quote, one of the 10 creepiest museums in the world. <laughs> not us. Audrey had come to research her next book, which was about a little girl growing up in the freak show. My excuse was that I taught anatomy at the School of the Art Institute, and this promised to be an encyclopedia of human variation. So we wandered around, peering at the faint spidery labels before finally going downstairs, where jars of preservatives lent the air a chemical tang. You will now see me drop a lot of paper on the ground. It's a technique. Um, I went over to examine a case full of fetuses. Each little body had somewhat more, or rather less, than the regulation number of parts. I thought about my mother, who'd been a researcher in teratology, that is, the study of birth anomalies, in the years before I was born. I wondered what she would have made of this wall of jars. I tried to dredge up whatever bits of embryology I could remember, reciting them dutifully to Audrey, and thought I was being wonderfully objective which stopped the moment I reached the middle of the next case. Suddenly, I was standing in front of my own body. To be exact, bodies, an entire shelf of jars containing fetuses with spina bifida. This one had my precise version. There are different kinds. This one is called myelomeningocele. Despite having been told that I was abnormal my entire life, it had never quite occurred to me that I was worthy of being a collectible. <laughs> Yet here I was, face to back with myself. Spina bifida means split spine. It, this happens when the bones of the spinal cord don't quite fuse all the way around, or the bones of the spinal column, rather, don't fuse all the way around the spinal cord. It ends up protruding sort of like a snag of yarn from the infant's back. My mother had also said that I'd had some kind of tumor, and I wondered, was this me as well, but rendered as taxidermy? Spina bifida is described as a lesion, but these bulging fetuses looked like they were about to explode. I looked up to see Audrey staring at me, clearly worried that I was about to explode, or perhaps keel over in a dead faint, which would have been dangerous given my my location and apparent collectability. <laughs> but I just stood there, immobilized. These fetuses were obviously old, much older than I. Immersion had swollen their bodies until they'd become too big for their jars, like inmates pushing against the bars of their cells. Their faces were turned to the wall, yet I felt their eyes sucking me straight through the glass. I realized that I was looking at the slipstream of my own alternate history. I was born in 1958 at Cincinnati Jewish Hospital. I was immediately carted across the street to Children's Hospital, where a young doctor named Lester Martin had just been hired as a pediatric surgeon. He'd trained at Harvard in brand new techniques to close a split spine. Before the 1950s, kids like me had pretty much died soon after birth of infections, hydrocephalus, or organ failure. If we survived, we were often stranded in institutions for the rest of our lives. We had little opportunity to become functional adult citizens. Breakthroughs in post-war medicine saved thousands of children from things that would have killed us just a few years earlier. It let us live with rather than die from our disabilities. But we entered a world that wasn't ready for us. There wasn't so much of a public curb cut 
or a ramp, much less the ADA. There was a lag between our worlds. I am a member of this first generation of survivors. This makes my body a marker in time. As a Jewish kid, I'd grown up aware that everyone's body is a product of history. I'd spent my childhood in a neighborhood of Holocaust survivors. We American kids were taught about the precarious effect of time and place, that where you lived and when you lived made all the difference. But disability enlarges our view into physical reality. I call it the great billboard of bodily truth. My time and place had everything to do with Dr. Martin. If I'd been born earlier or farther away, like, I don't know, Dayton, um, I might have ended up in a as a med school specimen myself. But Dr. Martin kept inventing and reinventing my body. By the time I was 17, he'd operated on me at least 35 times. Yet 1958 was hardly a medical bright line. Breakthroughs in spina bifida treatment have kept coming every year, yet international debate persists over whether to treat these infants, infants like me, at all. After the mutter, my timeline began to haunt me. I started to research Dr. Martin. I thought he'd have been long gone, and I was amazed to find out that he was still around and that he was still a total patrician hunk at the age of 93. <laughs> I cannot tell you what a crush my mother had on this man. <laughs> Eventually, I got enough courage to call and ask if I could come visit. I can't even describe what it was like to hear his voice. This was weirder than calling for a date with David Bowie. <laughs> it was more like making plans to meet God. Just choosing the outfit pretty much did me in exactly what did one wear for meeting one's literal maker. As you can see, I went with black chiffon. <laughs> My brother, who's also a doctor, came with me. We sat in Dr. Martin's sunny kitchen, and we talked about medical history. At one point, I asked, when you're considering what to do for a patient, do you picture what kind of life they might be capable of? How does that affect your decision making? He paused, and he looked puzzled, and said, well, mostly it's just a matter of what's technically practical at the time. That pretty much guides what we do. The answer disappointed me. But since then, I've asked many surgeons about the role of the medical imagination, and every single one of them has just given a technical answer and avoided talking about the relationship between their choices and the lives of resultant patient bodies. The scholar Megan Bales told me about where some of the mutter specimens came from. I was just telling Ren Weschler, who's back there, who also thought it was hilarious. Um, back when it was a teaching collection, doctors would stop by the lobby at the end of the day. They'd bring along the interesting body parts that had been reaped from that day's surgeries, or as I like to think of it, the catch of the day. <laughs> they dropped these into a huge vat of formaldehyde in the college lobby, sometimes leaving a note out outlining their salient points. Every night, technicians would fish them out, I sort of imagined guppy nets, and pop them in jars for chemical eternity. A century later, there I was, watching the fetuses, still floating inside their round glass houses. They had no props, no garments, and bore no marks of time or experience. Their whole bodies fit in the jars, so they looked like whole people, but really they were just body parts. Their scant biographies were simply the labels that listed their anomalies. The silence produced its own effects. The writer Alice Drager says that we see children as angels, but fetuses as scarcely human at all. These fetuses were perfect ahistorical bodies. In a way, I too have no history. I have no spina bifida elders, or very few, to show me how to live, what it means to grow up like this, or how to age. Jar babies are my ancestors. Bodies in teaching collections are supposed to be touched. There are bridges for doctors to cross as they prepare to engage with living patients. Doctors learn to have responsibility for both the living and the dead that come under their hands. But when the Mutter Museum became public, all the bodies were sealed behind glass. Now, no one touches them. Maybe there's the occasional dusting, I'm not sure. Um, and you can look all you want, but nothing requires that you understand them. 
that you see them as people or that you bear any responsibility for them at all. Their labels tell us where and how to look with texts that are written for the able-bodied as they look upon the abnormal. So the visitors themselves are sealed off under layers of glass. So I wondered what happens when most of the visitors, visitors are able-bodied and the collection is comprised of impaired bodies. Disabled specimens either demonstrate impairments that seem to have been cured out of existence or they embody problems that society seeks to eradicate. Modern medicine reassures us that their bodies belong to the past or they promise us that they'll be gone in our perfect future world. There will be no more people like me. They exist in a split timeline, a tempest bifida, that flows around us on either side, leaving us, the normal, safely untouched in the present. I saw how this reassurance works when I went to see the photographer Elena Herzog at an event in Los Angeles. She's the wife of filmmaker Werner Herzog. Lena photographed the famous Kunstkamera in St. Petersburg, Russia. This was the first museum in Russia, and it was founded by Peter the Great all the way back in 1716. But like the Mutter, the collection was based on specimens of disabled bodies, but this time human and animal. For me, Herzog's pictures portrayed the fetuses as ghosts and aliens. The very title of her series, Lost Souls, pushes them straight off our planet into purgatory. Herzog had said that it was difficult to get permission to shoot the collection, and that it had been a very disturbing place. Clearly so, as she's depicted the faces as weeping or screaming in pain. But even her intense emotion doesn't ask us to identify with these creatures. The photographs, for me, constitute remote viewing, sentimental, titillating, and detached all at the same time. I kept thinking about all the people I know who have similar impairments to those in both these museums all the artists and writers and performers who do gorgeous work about life in variant bodies. Leona Herzog could have shown us that the world had changed from 1716. She could have said, now people like this love, live among us and that they're changing what it means to be human. She could have made a bridge from the lost souls to found lives, but she left the glass in place and we remain on the placid isle of normalcy. I call this narrative stripping. Biography is peeled away until nothing is left but naked diagnosis and projected fear. The most benign reason for this is patient privacy, but in narrative stripping, the details of the life are torn away just when we need to understand its potential. I went through literal medical stripping when I was 12 and then again when I was 17. I was taken into a hospital theater and I had my gown removed. I stood naked in front of an audience full of doctors. I did not speak. I was described in terms of my anomalies. Somehow this was supposed to be for my own good or someone's good. Yet other kinds of stripping happen to me almost every day. Consider, for instance, the comments I get on my morning run. <clears throat> Miss, miss, are you a dwarf? Um, not, not really, not exactly. Um, hey, what, what kind of shoes are those? I expensive. <laughs> um, oh, you are such an inspiration. You're just so brave to be out here. Taking a walk is brave. Okay, and this is my all-time favorite. Hey lady, hey lady, do you need a ride to the hospital? Sometimes this comes to me from total left field. I first wrote this talk for a recent conference. Sorry, sound effects, comma, unintentional. The organizer is a great friend of mine who I thought understood who I was. So I was rather surprised when he called me to read the blurb that he'd written for the conference website. After all, I had sent him my professional bio, 
you know, Riva Lair is on faculty of blah, blah, blibbly, blibbly, blah, you know, the usual. I quickly found out that he'd made my biography much more exciting. I just happen to have some of the descriptions here. in case you can't see it in the back rows. Um, and to be fair, one of those words was one I came up with. So see, I am being fair. Um, so as I'm holding this up, you guys can see this, right? <clears throat> as you can see, item number six is that I am trapped in my body. For me, this raises a burning question. How many of you guys are buying day passes out of your bodies? <laughs> Raise your hands. I apparently am the only one who missed that Groupon. I worried that the only reason that people would buy tickets to my talk was if I let him describe me as the freak in residence. I thought, hmm, perhaps it wasn't too late to grow a second head. With all of this, though, it might surprise you that I don't object to the display of human specimens. I love anatomy. I love its secret beauties. Most of my portrait subjects, many of the, whom you've seen as I've been talking, are people with opulent variations. I love how their bodies respond to circumstance in unforeseen and poetic ways. But I'm careful to create in my anatomy courses methods that counter the approach taken by traditional art studios. <clears throat> Pardon me. The standard method in teaching anatomy for artists is to teach the body through classical standards of proportion and measurement. I refuse to teach anyone that the human body is supposed to be seven and a half heads high. Instead, thank you, curtsy. Uh, instead, I use all of us as examples, including the models, the students, and my own peculiar form. I want us to look at what's actually there, not draw from an imaginary norm. And God help anyone who squashes our model into that damn Vitruvian circle. Every year, I'm surrounded by fascinating bodies when I go to the Society for Disability Studies conference. The attendees inhabit a full range of human variation, and my own body feels joyful and relaxed in a way that just doesn't seem to be possible anywhere else. But there's a difference between that diversity and a trip to a medical museum, which technically is also full of my people. <clears throat> At the museum, my experiences are irrelevant. Medical museums are not interested in the creativity of disability. There's no trace of the kind of stories I hear about disabled lives, stories of adventure and mystery and romance, Stories that make me want to stand in front of the museum cases and tell them to every single passerby. Even with that, though, there's a way that it's hard for disabled people to talk about our own bodies. Even the most neutral clinical language is still based on dichotomies of illness and cure. Medical terms describe us as deformed, defective, and broken. As soon as you define a body as abnormal, it slides into the category of needing to be fixed. Language itself, then, breaks us into pieces. So we often turn to theory or politics and leave the corporeal outside the door. I would look naive or deluded if I said that I'm not my body. I am, and I'm not, and so, and neither are you. The difference is that normal bodies get to pretend that they're invisible. Variant bodies get to wear t-shirts that proclaim, not a prison. I've spent my life as an artist trying to reverse narrative stripping in the lives of my subjects. I think of it as repatriation through portraiture. Every portrait begins with long interviews. Some of my collaborators are disabled and some are not. Some just feel like mutants because of all the ways you can grow up feeling like a weirdo. Here, for instance, is someone a number of you will know, graphic novelist Alison Bechdel. 
Allison just won a MacArthur grant. I was very glad to snag her before the apotheosis. <laughs> for 20 years, Allison drew a comic strip entitled Dykes to Watch Out For. This examined the lesbian community with wit and irony. Eventually, she turned to memoir. The first was Fun Home, which was about her father and his sexuality and um, suicide. And this was followed by Are You My Mother, um, somewhat less dramatic, but uh, very introspective. Through all of this, we talked a lot about what it meant to be pursued by specters of our mothers. This led to the imagery that you see behind me here. Is Allison a person with a disability? Some of you may know, some of you may not, but I'm going to leave that up to you to decide. You've seen a lot of my work today, but now I'm going to do something that makes me really nervous. I'm going to proceed two portraits with specimen photographs. In any other context, I would consider this completely unethical, but today I'm going to ask you to consider and really think about how the pairs of images affect your perceptions. Matt Fraser was born in London in the 1960s when thousands of European mothers were given thalidomide to treat morning sickness. It was really great at stopping breakfast barf, but it was also excellent at mutating fetal limb buds. Focomelia, in fact, means seal-like limbs. When I asked Matt to sit for me, he said, of course, darling, but only if I can do it naked. <laughs> his nickname is Teflon Matt. I've never known anyone with a harder time keeping his clothes on. <laughs> He's the son of two actors, and he aimed for a career in the theater himself, but the only roles he got offered were as monsters and beggars, or monsters that begged. So Matt began to write his own material. In his research, he discovered a 1940s freak show performer named Celo the Seal Boy. Celo also had short arms due to phocomelia, which can arise spontaneously, not just via um, thalidomide. Celo's act consisted of shaving, lighting cigarettes, cooking, hammering nails, many activities of daily living in front of the audience, which he turned into a blend of high comedy and high drama. Matt did a one-man one show as CeeLo at the Coney Island Freak Show for many years. Since then, Matt's gone on to a very successful career, including stage, film, and television, and including a very recent off-Broadway interpretation of Beauty and the Beast with his wife, burlesque queen Julie Atlas Muse. It got fantastic reviews in the Times. Ironically, though, his fame right now is rising as one of the stars of TV's American Horror Story, Colin Freak Show. When I asked Chicago actress Techie Limnicki to sit for me, she thought I was asking her to pose nude, and she was totally up for it. But she said nothing. So I had no idea, and I ended up painting her in a satin slip that she wore in Alchemy, which is her solo show built around numerous characters, including a nun and a lounge singer. In the Alchemy, she recounts her mother's attempt to get Techie cured at Lourdes, and Techie's life is a hypochondriac, and what it's like to try and date men who see you as a child and not as a grown woman. By the time I found out that she'd been wheeling to go au natural, it was way too late, and I had added another item to my list of lifetime regrets. Before I showed you Allison's portrait, I did not preface it with a slide of the normal female body. I did show you specimen images before Matt and Techie. I want you to consider whether you used the first slide to understand the second. Disabled people can be forced to offer up their diagnoses to placate intrusive people. It gives such people the illusion that they understand us, but we erase ourselves in doing so. I've tried not to impose my own narratives on people who sit for me. The last thing I want to do is replicate the history of erasure and stripping. So we employ a collaborative ethical structure that offers a lot of control over what's going to happen and what their imagery will end up being. And I never ask a disabled subject to pose nude for me unless, like Matt, this is their choice. Nude bodies easily become specimen images if all that the viewers offered is pure morphology. 
and no story. I want to embed the body so deeply in its story that it, the two cannot be pulled apart. A friend recently told me the French scientists have discovered a cure for dwarfism, and I think she meant that as good news. But all I could see were my friends being hoovered straight out of history. This is what happens when those in charge think that our stories are simply those of suffering. After all, who would want a body that's just composed of pain? And why do we assume that pain is truer than any other part of our lives? I want to propose, therefore, an alternate approach to human display. What if specimens were accompanied by text and or video interviews? What if we construct methods by which disabled bodies can represent themselves in museums, in exhibits, wherever curiosity of the body is brought before the public, but with a silence? Let's insist on a full complexity that includes innovation and pleasure, and not just pain and fear. After all, who here has never experienced any form of pain? Raise your hand. It's unanimous. How many of you would not have wanted to live your life because of pain's contribution? Keeping biography with the body matters. It changes what a doctor decides to do. It changes how a genetics counselor talks to prospective parents. It changes how politicians make our laws. Above all, it matters to that disabled person standing in front of a glass case full of jars. Thank you. We do have time for several questions, if there's anyone here in the audience that would like to ask. I will ask you questions if you don't. <laughs> I'm not shy. Aaron? Give me one second to bring you the microphone, please. <coughs> no, we need the video recorder, so with that, yeah. Thanks. What kind of questions do you ask people whom you are about to paint? Well, um, so the question, if you couldn't hear it, was, what do I ask people who I'm going to paint? Um, it depends on what's going on. I work in series, and they start usually with a central question. So I've asked, in the first series I did, I asked people about the relationship of their life to their work. So these were disabled people who did various forms of art, and I asked about the influence of the disabled body on their production. But then after that, I started to become somewhat more abstract. I've asked people about, I'm very interested in the use of the imagination as a survival mechanism. So I ask people about the things they turn to when they're really under stress, their sort of inner compendium of metaphor that gets them through difficulty. Um, I've been asked people lately about their lost bodies. i um, been doing a series called Ghost Parade where I'm asking people about bodies that they used to have or bodies they imagined having. So there's, there's different questions that come up. Um, what I'm doing right this second, though, is a little different. I'm working on a new ethics project where I, don't, I do a minimal amount of interview. The person comes to my studio, sits for me, and then I, I leave the house for several hours after a sitting. And they're encouraged to draw on their own portrait. And then I come back, we discuss what they did, I respond to it, and it goes back and forth. So I'm, I'm trying, what I'm really interested in right now is the power relationship in portraiture and um, the ethics of control and how to make that a productively mutual experience. Next question. Lauren? You said that you try not to um, put your story too much on other bodies. How has the experience of, of talking to and, and painting and drawing other subjects, other bodies, changed how you see and feel about and feel in your own body? It's completely changed it. When I first started working on disability, it was in the mid-90s, and I don't talk about this here, but um, for most of my life, until I was in my, I guess, late 30s, <clears throat> I'm very old broad now, um, I absolutely despised myself. 
I had no good models of being disabled. I thought it was something just immensely shameful to be hidden. And it also didn't help that the few times I tried to work on disability uh, in my visual work that my collectors and galleries and stuff had just run away screaming. So, um, so it wasn't until I started meeting people who were radical and really rethought what it meant to have an impairment and were working on disability politics that I started to have a framework that was m much more useful. And so as I've worked through that, um, my sense of being human has really increased. I really didn't feel like a human being for most of my life. Um, this is what happens when you grow up in a society where you do not see yourself reflected anywhere, unless it's really miserably negative reflections. So I really started to move towards a feeling of, this is why I use the word variation so much, because I started to understand that we are variant, that it wasn't that there are these humans over there, and then there's this horrible little monster of me. And so as I've been working with people, not just disabled, but getting to see the inside story of people who I would have assumed were um, peaceful around their bodies and finding out that that wasn't the case, um, it's, it's really been transformative. And it's also been really great in that the effect my work has had in disability culture has been really gratifying. So it's been, it's been a, a circular conversation at every level. Um, I have a microphone right here. Uh, oh, Julia. Hi, Reva. Hey. Can you talk a little bit about um, your materials choices? I feel like um, work I've seen of yours that's a little bit older is very much painting and drawing. And your work more and more seems to be kind of coming out of the page with your choice of different materials. I'm curious about the choices and also if how and if there's a relationship between just the, the evolution of, of your engagement in the process with your subjects. Well, I need to go back and do some painting. I, I miss it really badly. I've sort of, I've been on a rolling show deadlines and I can draw a lot faster than I can paint. So that's one thing. I'm also just not as good a painter, which I want to fix. Um, but the constructions, I've, I'm really interested in fragility. Um, I think, I, especially in the work I'm doing now, I'm thinking a lot about vulnerability and fragility and how the things I make are echoes of my own body, which is partly why I'm having people come in and mess around with them and to some extent risk ruining them. Um, because I feel like I'm facing my own experience of fragility. So there's this famous philosophical, I don't remember who said it, but the statement there's no such thing as a baby. And what the philosopher was trying to get at was that a baby only exists through community, community um, and personal commitment that if you leave a baby alone for a day, there's no more baby. Um, and so I, I often think of drawings that way when I go to the museums and I see these very fragile old drawings up on a, you know, framed on the wall. I think about all of the decisions that had to be there in order to rescue this little piece of paper for 600 years. And there's a way that I feel really personally allied to that piece of paper. So that's part of it. Also, um, I, you know, I keep trying to be restless. I keep trying to kind of mess up my ability to be in control of my materials. Because um, you can get so macho with uh, <coughs> obsessive rendering that it just be becomes an end in itself and it becomes boring and pointless. So I've, I've made things a lot less controllable. Yay. <laughs> Hi. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering um, if you've, or how you think about mental health in relation to some of the forms of disability that you um, work on and have been talking about. I get asked a lot about whether or not I work with people with invisible disabilities. Um, I will say that a couple of the people that you saw her here do have them. Um, 
because our imagery wasn't around that, I don't usually describe it. Um, it's, it's tricky because most of the imagery I've seen around forms of mental illness or mental impairment are really trite. And I've always been nervous about how to represent um, certain conditions without falling into those traps. It's not that I don't want to. Um, and certainly, you know, anyone in the arts has their own interesting dance with this stuff. Um, but right now, because I'm an anatomist, I'm most interested in physical manifestations, partly because um, it's much harder to pass. Uh, I'm, I'm most interested in people at the moment who can't really pass. Um, does that answer it? Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking how you're talking about imagination. Well, we, we've, in, when I've talked to people about survival and imagination, we do end up talking about depression and mania and, you know, lots of stuff. And um, often the images will be sort of talismans in the middle of that storm. So, and like I said, I haven't necessarily discussed that in some, some things I do kind of keep private. Even with the physical stuff, there's stuff I don't, there's lots I don't go into um, in the imagery when I talk about it. Anyone else? Gay? Give me one second to get t the mic to you. More tea. A few minutes ago, um, you mentioned the power, power relationship when you're painting a portrait. As a former portrait painter, I'd like to know more about that. I'd like to know what you think about it. Back everyone, back up, there comes the rant. Um, I, I, I don't have time to go into all of it, but basically I've been thinking about the historical role of portraits, how they either shored up the power of the elite, um, which you know we all know about, and how artists have responded to that. Um, uh, and it has to do with um, death, about whose immortality matters. So does the immortality of the subject matter, or is it the immortality of the artist? And those are two different things, and they're expressed two different ways. And so, I've been thinking about portraiture as a struggle over um, tandem death. And so it's usually been a situation where in the moment one is ascendant and later that may not be the ascendant person. So for instance, if we look at a Holbein, we care because it's a Holbein, not because it's Duke of Wetzit. But at the time, it was important that it was Duke of Wetzit. So, as you can tell, I'm a historian. Um, but so that's, that's a little bit of it, but also um, I just read a fantastic essay by a writer named Thomas Kauser um, talking about representing vulnerable populations. I don't know if any of you have read Kauser, um, but talking about the duty of care of representing people who basically cannot speak for themselves. And I do a certain amount of that. Um, I also just was running a portrait project at Bryn Mawr um, where I had a group of undergrads and grads doing portraits of um, adults with cognitive and intellectual disabilities. And that's been really fascinating, having them do mutual portraits of each other and how to listen and how to get stories from people who are essentially not always verbal and what a story is. So. There's lots of pieces that feed into this. Take me out for dinner, I'll tell you more. <laughs> um, per, oh, back, okay. I was wondering if you can comment on uh, any uh, kind of differences between acquired versus congenital uh, kind of experiences uh, with, you know, going from being able to be an invisible body to, to one that is either, you know, disfigured, disabled, or whatever, whatever word. Right. Um, well, that's a big thing. I mean, some of the people whose portraits I've done 
it, they fall on both sides of that. So acquired and natal disabilities. It depends on when it was acquired, how it was acquired. Um, there certain, certainly isn't a blanket narrative for either side, but it tends to be a situation where there's a different kind of grieving that sometimes happens for people who acquire a significant impairment. Um, and it's really complicated. So for instance, I've been, uh, the last few months I was on Facebook with this group called Adults with Spina Bifida looking for ancestors. And I'm used to hanging out with disabled people who are pretty political and pretty much involved in disability culture. And this was an entire group of people who had, as far as I could tell, virtually no politics and no knowledge whatsoever of a disability culture at all. And when I tried gently to insert some, there was a lot of resistance and um, worse. And they used a lot of, and these are people with natal disabilities who, for me, I'm used to kind of having those people have a lot of um, self-awareness around what it means to be disabled. But here were several thousand people um, who their dialogue was all very, we're all such special angels or we're all, we're all suffering and life is terrible. And I, I hung in there as long as I could and then I ran screaming, it's a chicken. Um, so even in a population that I'm used to having be fairly savvy about this stuff, that I forget that I live in a little bubble of people, this tiny, tiny percentage of disabled people who are involved on a certain level, who go to the conferences, who make work, who you know are politically involved. And the vast majority of disabled people, I don't think this is where they are. And so when I think about natal disabilities and acquired disabilities, I think it's really mushy. Um, I used to think of more of a, a dividing line, and now I, I don't. I don't think that that's quite the case. So, it, if that makes sense, there was someone over here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. I thought there would be two people here, and there's at least three. So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>